thank Dr. Srinivas for uh, giving me an opportunity to be here. Uh, so in continuation with the acute presentations, I'll be talking on uh, how to approach a patient with hypoxemia. I will just go through a few case scenarios just to understand what are the types of patients that we often get in the intensive care in relation to this kind of a presentation. So there's a 25 year old gentleman who came with a short history of fever of a couple of days associated with uh, some productive cough, had some respiratory distress. On examination, the ER was found to be in respiratory distress, having a saturation of about 75 on room air, ABG of 55. Uh, on uh, non-rebreather mask found to have that his saturation goes up to 85 but still in need of a lot of oxygen, a normal ECG and X-ray showing bilateral alveolar interstitial opacity. So this is one picture that we get, something like what we would consider as viral pneumonia or something similar or some sort of an atypical pneumonia with early ARDS. Case number two, 65 year old diabetic with acute onset of dyspnea, uh, having a systolic blood pressure of 100, cold clammy peripheries, bradycardic saturating low about 75 percent, STT changes uh, with the suggestion of a pulmonary edema on the x-ray, low PO2 again. This is our second type of presentation. So the first type looked like a primary respiratory problem, second one looks like a cardiac leading on to a cardiogenic uh, shock and, and uh, an LV failure causing pulmonary edema. Number three, known asthmatic presenting with some cough, increasing breathlessness. Uh, labored breathing, reasonably okay saturation 85 percent, improves with normal rebreather, still some labored breathing continues, seems to be having type 2 respiratory failure on the ABG with the CO2 which was elevated. So this is presentation number 3 with X-ray looking fairly normal except showing a lot of hyperlucency in the thing which was all suggestive of bronchospasm. Number 4, post-op, day 4 develops after an RTA, fixing the femur, bed bound, develops sudden onset of breathlessness in the hospital associated with uh, hypoxia and type 2 failure, normal looking ECG, normal looking chest x-ray, okay. Number 6, known COPD with worsening of his breathing difficulty over the last few days, relatively normal lung in terms of no acute problem but showing some old emphysematous bullous changes, normal pH but a chronic type 2 failure. So these are all the different kinds of presentations that we can get when somebody comes to you with hypoxia and all these should actually go through your mind when you are actually dealing with somebody who does have hypoxia. Exactly as Dr. Rahul mentioned to you in the previous talk, a syndromic approach is something that is very important. Now we will just go through two quick definitions, hypoxia, what is hypoxia? Is hypoxia and hypoxemia the same? It is not. Hypoxia is defined as the reduced level of tissue oxygenation. So anything can cause hypoxia starting from decreased oxygen in the lung, alveolus, of decreased oxygenation of the blood, hypotension, hypovolemia, low hemoglobin, a lot of things. So we, when we talk about hypoxia, we are actually referring, referring to tissue level uh, oxygenation. On the other hand, hypoxemia is nothing but decreased arterial partial pressure of oxygen in the blood which means decreased oxygen carrying capacity or dissolved oxygen is what we call as hypoxemia. The two common definitions of respiratory failure, type 1 or hypoxemic respiratory failure where we do have hypoxia with normal CO2 or a drop in the oxygen from a baseline by more than 10 percent. Type 2 respiratory failure is hypoxemia associated with an elevated PCO2 which is a CO2 of more than 50. Now what are the causes for hypoxemia? From a very puristically physiological standpoint, we could actually tell there are four kind of mechanisms for, why, for which hypoxemia actually occurs. The first one is what is called as hyperventilation, as you can see where there is uh, decreased ventilation or uh, minute ventilation for whatever reason. It could be an obstruction, decreased effort, neuromuscular problems, whatever it is. Second is there is diffusion impairment. So air comes till here, normal oxygen in the alveolus but there is impaired diffusion across the uh, alveolar capillary membrane. Third is shunts, both intrapulmonary, extrapulmonary, intracardiac, extracardiac, whatever where there is an admixture of deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood which can be another cause and number four could be ventilation perfusion mismatch where there is varying levels of lot of ventilation in some places less perfusion or there is more perfusion in one place but less ventilation. So there is a mismatch as you all know the normal VQ ratio is around 0.8 so any alteration in this could actually result in what is called as ventilation perfusion mismatch and any of these things can be caused for hypoxia when you talk about it from a mechanistic point of view. Okay. Now when we talk about diseases, it may not be that there is one particular mechanism causing, you may actually have one or two multiple mechanisms actually coming into the fore when we talk about such a problem. Uh, so we will start with ventilation perfusion mismatch to start with. Uh, you should understand that 
there could be a mismatch either because of less ventilation and more or normal or more perfusion which is called a low VQ or you could have a high VQ mismatch where there is more ventilation happening and the reduced sort of perfusion happening or could be a normal ventilation with reduction of the perfusion. So any of these, both of these things can actually cause hypoxia but there is more hypoxia here whereas here there is more carbon dioxide retention when the perfusion is reduced there is more carbon dioxide, reti uh, re uh, carbon dioxide retention because by minute ventilation compensation there is actually compensation of the hypoxia. But if the compensatory hy uh, hyperventilation does not exist or compensation, compensatory ventilation does not take place then we may end up with hypoxia in the second setting as well. So this was about VQ mismatch. We will go to the next one which is uh, pulmonary shunts or, intra or extra pulmonary shunts which is nothing but venous admixture as I told you. Hypoxia is there, CO2 is normal sometimes can be actually low because of the hypoxia driven respiratory uh, sorry hypoxia driven minute ventilation which runs the uh, which drags the CO2 down. But the important thing to understand here is there is very poor response to oxygen therapy because there is a big shunt fraction of more than 50, uh, 20 percent which actually shifts all the administered blood from the uh, venous side into the arterial side of the circulation. Next is diffusion impairment. Here we find that there is increased AA gradient which is a diffusion measurement of the diffusion across the membrane. But the CO2 may be normal till very late and CO2 goes up in very very late in or in very advanced forms of the disease. Hypoventilation as I told you is always associated with hypoxia, is also associated with elevated CO2 very early on. In fact, hypoxia may often be very easily corrected with the advent or with uh, administration of oxygen. Now it is important to understand all these various combinations because based on this it is very much easier to understand the causes, etiology, mechanism of respiratory failure. So grossly the causes of respiratory failure to summarize can be said hypoventilation which could be because of upper airway disorders, strider, tumor, lower airway problems, bronchospasm, neuromuscular disorders where the pump has failed, diffusion impairment due to acute chronic problems which could be cardiogenic, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So largely hypoxemic cardio, uh, hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure in the ICU con comes into this area because it could be a pulmonary edema due to a variety of causes, diffuse pneumonia, pulmonary hemorrhage, shunt which could be intra or extra pulmonary shunts which will cardiac or extra cardiac and different forms of VQ mismatch. The most common example being pulmonary embolism or a very extensive low bar pneumonia which can also cause a significant shunt when the shunt is more than 20 percent. Now what is the diagnostic approach to uh, for all these different things that we have spoken about? So any approach always when we, I will talk about the approach in two aspects, one is the diagnostic aspect and the therapeutic aspect. The historically when you talk about any diagnostic approach of course history is important. Uh, symptoms of hypoxia such as mild drowsiness, irritability, uh, patient having uh, as the hypoxia worsens you find that they get more and more irritable can end up with seizures. Hypercapnic symptoms on the other hand are better tolerated, they are actually having um, headache, uh, there is a, a drowsiness. But uh, they are actually less irritable, less uh, sort of restless and aggressive and that is the difference between a symptom of hypoxia and symptoms of hypercapnia. And hypoxic symptoms can be even more difficult to manage as compared to hypercapnia and that is actually a problem because uh, hypoxia presents early whereas when somebody is gradually building up hypercapnia you may actually end think that the patient is sleeping, he is comfortable and you may actually miss the diagnosis and end up uh, managing the patient very late. On examination the priority will be to make sure that you secure that you maintain the, uh, the circulation airway breathing that is important. Then you can start looking for other things like respiratory system examination, accessory muscle use, saturation, hypoventilation present or not, respiratory signs, chest findings so on and so forth. Oximetry will be helpful, very good bedside tool, generally freely available and a very accurate mode of measurement. Blood gas analysis will give you a lot of information about the respiratory gases whether there is adequate compensation, any other associated problems like metabolic acidosis, lactates, electrolytes, so on and so forth. Uh, appropriate blood tests will give you some clues to the possibility. So if you are asking for a electrolyte, hypokalemia there, that could be the cause of the respiratory weakness uh, or if there is uh, elevated total count, infections, ECG, portable chest X-ray will give you a picture of the lung and the heart on a gross scale. Capnometry if available, pulmonary function tests. Now after all these basic tests we start looking for sort of other modalities of investigation which could be imaging, non-imaging, imaging could be CT of the chest, echocardiography, very useful test at the bedside and today's uh, ICU we talk about lung ultrasound, 
ventilation perfusion scanning probably a little redundant in today's world especially in the critical care setting and a number of lab tests which can give you a clue such as cardiac enzymes and D-dimer tests. So a brief suggested algorithm of diagnostic approach is when somebody has hypoxemia go through the AA gradient if the gradient is normal it is most likely hypoventilation which is often easily corrected with oxygen. If the gradient is widened it could be because of a VQ mismatch, diffusion limitation or a shunt shunt often is very poorly corrected with oxygen whereas the other two get corrected and therefore you can differentiate a VQ mismatch or a diffusion limitation from a uh, uh, from a shunt. Aim of therapy in four broad principles is to maintain oxygen, keep up drop the carbon dioxide or eliminate the carbon dioxide, eventually is to actually maintain tissue perfusion and also if possible take away the work of breathing if somebody is maintaining these, such, is these gas exchange ratios with a lot of effort. So this is going to be the gross overview of how we actually try to manage anybody with respiratory failure. Um, so important thing is correction of hypoxemia and hypoxia because it is sort of linked. So ultimate goal as I told you is to actually make sure that there is no tissue level hypoxia because that is the one which actually causes all the adverse effects of hypoxia that we talk about. So the treatment approach will be to address the circulation airway breathing issue whatever it may be maybe just a simple oxygen mask it may be need for ventilation NIV so on and so for anything whatever it is but uh, that is the priority then assess the airway through the normal standard protocol that we have if somebody is not very conscious airway may be a priority if somebody is able to protect airway just needs a bit of secretion clearance do that if they, they just need some assistance with oxygen do that so whatever it is. Then we talk about bridging therapy. Bridging therapy is to maintain the gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, maintain the normal physiology or milieu interior till the cause is actually treated. Now there are different scales or different degrees of therapy when we talk about maintaining or providing bridging therapy starting from a simple oxygen mask, non-invasive ventilator which now also includes high flow oxygen, mechanical ventilation, extreme forms of mechanical ventilation like prone ventilation and ECMO. So what we choose at what level we start will all depend on how sick or how, uh, how early the patient has actually come to you. Now going to the oxygen mask, uh, it is a good simple starting measure to use and in fact nobody will blame you if you just say somebody walks in 90 percent saturation just put an oxygen mask, no harm done. The normal person saturation is around 94 to 98 percent as they get older as you know there is a tendency to drop the, in the oxygenation so 92 to 94 percent is acceptable. So if somebody is having 95 percent saturation relatively comfortable you do not have to go and slap an oxygen mask on their face it is probably not necessary but if you are in doubt always do that it is safer to give oxygen than not to give oxygen if you ask, ask me personally. In patients at risk of type 2 failure this is a special subset of patients type 2 respiratory failure the target oxygenation will be between 88 to 92 percent or 88 to 90 percent and it is useful if the oxygen uh, this mask is useful if the oxygen is requirement is up to about 0.6 percent and there is reasonable effort and no necessity for any form of PEEP or end expiratory pressure or any, any sort of positive pressure which is needed. In such a scenario this is a very useful uh, mode of delivering oxygen. We have two types of devices variable performance device which is your normal nasal prongs or mask oxygen and venti oxygen where you get a fixed performance which are called fixed performance devices. The newer talk in town is about high flow nasal cannula which as you can see in this diagram is high flow oxygen between 30 to 60 liters which goes through an active humidifier and through a heated inspiratory circuit is actually given through tight fitting large nasal prong which will tend to give good oxygenation hypoxic correction yes also seems to be giving a certain amount of positive airway pressure as well. So it is good for such disorders where you actually find that there is a certain amount of PEEP needed which actually tries to, which actually helps in correcting the hypoxemia. So some sort of an alternative for a lower grade or lower levels of CPAP as well. Uh, there is some data to say that it reduces risk of reintubation in patients with type 1 failure, large randomized trial has shown that it is useful, reduce reintubation rates in cardiac surgical patients both these are RCTs in multicentric trials. Uh, certain other studies, single center studies and prospective observational data show that it is non-inferior to NIV in other causes of type 1 respiratory failure including mild moderate ARDS as well and uh, there is possible benefit also seemingly emerging data to say that it may be beneficial in type 2 respiratory failure as well. Now these are all the lots of studies which have been looked by you, you comparing the high flow nasal cannula with mask oxygen found to be superior to mask oxygen in various clinical settings and um, in many settings equi efficacious to NIV as well. Uh, 
Non-invasive ventilator, all of us know who have been in working in ICU, it's been uh, there since the 90s. Initially started for a, uh, exacerbation of COPD or management of COPD patients. Subsequently, uh, sorry, it's not carcinogenic, it's cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Subsequently found to be useful for cardiogenic pulmonary edema, either CPAP or NIV. Exacerbation of asthma, caution, you can use it, but be careful, make sure that you are constantly watching the patient because you don't want to be losing that time interval where intubation needs to be done early. So it can be useful as a temporizing measure. Neuromuscular disorders, coma, uh, uh, morbid obesity, post-extubation strider, pneumonias, weaning from a ventilator can be done early. Post-operative patients or early post-operative patients can be extubated and put on NIV. So these are all different settings where NIV can be useful. Now, if NIV doesn't work or is the degree of support needed is much higher, then we talk about mechanical ventilation. Conventional ventilation, if somebody has neuromuscular paralysis, say for example, organophosphate, 8 ml per kg, standard ventilation, PEEP of 5 and FIO2 as required. ARDS is a special subset of patients, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is quite commonly seen post, uh, post uh, lung infections, post pneumonia or post extra pulmonary causes. So here we have the typical sort of uh, principles that we now have well laid down starting from low volume tidal ventilation between 4 to 6 ml per kg, permissive hypercapnia if you are unable to keep the CO2 down, you accept CO2 of uh, uh, whatever level as long as the pH stays above 7.2, moderate PEEP 8 to 12 centimeters of water based on individual clinical need, you can even go higher if there is suggestion that uh, it will, uh, there is recruitment possible or there is suggestion that a higher PEEP will benefit without compromising the uh, hemodynamics. A restricted fluid strategy and in more severe cases prone ventilation is useful and we do have good data now to say that there is significant mortality benefit with the use of prone ventilation. If all this fails, look at extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Venovenous is the preferred mode for hypoxemic respiratory failure or for type 2 hypercapnic hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, if there is associated shock, we talk about arteriovenous, uh, arteriovenous, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, arteriovenous ECMO. Now, a word about ultrasound at uh, uh, bedside ultrasonography and lung ultrasonography, which is the in thing today. Uh, this is uh, in patients with acute hypoxemia. This is the blue protocol by Daniel Lichtenstein, where he has suggested that there's about 99 to 100% sensitivity if you follow this protocol with the help of ultrasound in patients who have acute hypoxemia only. Now, if you, you can't do this ultrasound on me or you and say that, you know, the sensitivity is poor. So in somebody who presents with hypoxemia, this is a very useful tool and uh, the suggested schematic uh, pathway in the blue protocol is somebody who has lung sliding present Look for B lines. If B lines are present, it could be pulmonary edema, which could be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. That is not clear. That you will have to look into. If there are A lines which are present, which is normal uh, pattern, you look for DVT and, sub the, and the patient is hypoxic. Look for DVT, which could mean that if there is uh, evidence of uh, uh, venous thrombosis, it could be a pulmonary embolism. If there is no venous thrombosis, look, look at what is called as the PLAPS point or the posterior lateral area of the uh, uh, po uh, the, uh, the posterior axillary line, which will give you an idea of the posterior diaphragmatic, uh, posterior inferior recess of the uh, pleural space. If the lung slide is absent, with the, in the presence of B lines, it could be pneumonia or it could be pneumothorax, which you look for. Uh, the, unfortunately, I'm unable to play the videos because there's some problem with technical problems. I'm just sort of showing you only the pictures. So in summary, diagnostic algorithm would be that if somebody presents an algorithm uh, with hypoxemia, Look for the AA gradient. If it is normal, it could be hypoventilation, which is often easily corrected with oxygen. If the AA gradient is elevated, it could be any of the three causes like VQ mismatch, diffusion limitation or shunt. Shunt is actually not corrected with oxygen and the other two show some sort of partial response. And the treatment algorithm would be that always give emphasis on airway breathing and circulation. Bridging therapy could be anything depending on the severity of the patient and the extent of support that is needed and treating the cause is absolutely essential. Thank you.